All right. Welcome, everyone, to our, I believe it's, it is the 16th um, COVID-19 um, 2020 webinar. My name is Yasmina Sisarak, and I'm your host for today's webinar. Thank you all for joining us. We have about 300 attendees um, that have signed up. So the COVID-19 webinar series for this year are presented by the Health Matters Program in the Department of Disability and Human Development at the University of Illinois at Chicago through continued partnership with Project Search and their funding from the Ohio Developmental Disabilities Council, Council in collaboration with Aspire Community Services. Today, um, we have um, a very interesting presentation um, that talks about addressing challenges of social media for individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities and their and mental, mental health issues. With the social restrictions surrounding COVID-19, pandemic, connecting with others virtual, uh, via virtual and social media platforms has become much more prevalent. Individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities may have, may have barriers in accessing social media platforms, including experience in navigating and knowing appropriate ways of interacting and making connections virtually. A suggestion, hang on just a sec, someone is not muted and it's really fuzzy, okay. A suggestion for wellness and care, working in a collaborative partnership with the ARC of Gloucester offers a unique combination of features and services that allows for the provider to leverage their direct support staff to manage and moderate social media platform that include healthy group discussions in an anonymous, secure, and private manner with the individuals they serve um, the platform allows for personal choice, independence, safe and moderated social engagement, anonymity, staff facilitation, and 24-7 um, and access. So this presentation will share their experiences with the platform and then present ways to get involved and become collaborative partners. I wanted to introduce four presenters, and I'm just going to introduce them by name, and I'm going to let them introduce themselves individually. Uh, Greg Wilson, Jake Jones, Jade Pollack, and Robin Blanchard. Um, as always, we are recording this and we will make it available um, um, in several days on our YouTube channel. Um, welcome everyone, and Greg, you can take it away. Oh, well, very kind of you, Yasmina. Thank you very much. And uh, for what it's worth, uh, my name is Greg Wilson. I am the founder of the A Suggestion platform. We'll get into that in just a moment. Uh, but before we do, I just want to say a, a special note of thanks, Yasmina, to both you and to Beth and to the Health Matters program overall. We're delighted to have the opportunity to speak with you folks today, and we're really excited about today's session. So uh, we're hoping to walk you through a number of different social rooms that we've been able to create and talk about some of the use cases we've developed thus far, and hopefully we can spur up some nice questions toward the end of the session. So. Um, if I may, I'm going to do a very quick high-level introduction for each of the, the four of us here. Again, my name is Greg Wilson. I'm the CEO and the founder of A Suggestion. Uh, a Suggestion is, is a, effectively a communication and feedback platform. There's a lot that goes into it. There's a couple of different channels that we engage in, uh, but we're going to be talking today about the wellness and care offering. And along the way, I had the, uh, the pleasure of coming across Mr. Jake Jones. Jake Jones is the uh, the executive director of the ARC Glosser in southern New Jersey. He's a master trainer in crisis management and intervention strategies. Uh, and frankly, he helped me, helps to introduce me to Jay Pollock. Jay Pollock has been in the IDD and mental health space for some 14 years. Uh, she's the CEO of a similar agency down in southern New Jersey. And Jake is most uh, easily identified as the young lady holding a Starbucks coffee. Day, night, doesn't matter. She's in and out of Starbucks. That's how you're going to spot Jade. Robin, uh, I've had the pleasure of working with Robin now for almost a year. Robin is a registered nurse. She works with the ARC Gloucester. And Robin, we lovingly refer to her as our CGE. She is our content generating engine. And on this platform, she's been working hand in hand with individuals and a day in and day out perspective, helping to guide and educate them and coach them on ways in which to improve upon their social media interactions. So, uh, today's goals, what are we here to talk about? Um, 
for what a lousy presenter I would be if I'm quoting Aristotle, but yes, I'm going to quote Aristotle. Aristotle said a great presentation is you tell people what you're going to tell them, and then you tell them, and then you tell them what you told them. Well, I'm not going to do quite that. Today we're going to talk a little bit about the problem that we've identified uh, in the IDD mental behavioral health space. Then we're going to not just tell you what we've detailed thus far, but we'll actually show it to you. And then at the end of that session, we'll wrap it up with a quick summary. Well, what might this platform actually mean to you? How might you get involved? So we'll cruise through those last slides pretty quickly. Uh, so with that, I, I want to turn it over to Jake. Again, Jake, our Executive Director and CEO of his program at the Art Gloucester. Uh, Jake, could you do me a favor, uh, a very high-level introduction on who you are and you, what you do? And Jake, if you wouldn't mind, can you share the backstory? Absolutely. Can everyone hear me? We do. Okay, great. Okay, hello, everybody. Glad to be here. My name is Jake Jones. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of the ARC Gloucester in West Stamford, New Jersey. Um, my role in this panel is that um, many, many years ago, I was the person who noticed this problem and um, actually thought about a solution. Um, so, what is the problem? So, as the slide says, prior to COVID-19, individuals living with IDD uh, have experienced challenges with social media. Uh, when we talk about social media and our individuals, we know first that our individuals have skill deficits. And we know that skill deficits can be a barrier to making inclusive relationships. Uh, secondarily, um, social media has inherent um, dangers. Um, such as predatory behavior uh, by people and bias that our, our unwitting um, individuals that we care for could become victims of these things. Um, I think most importantly as well, um, a lot of these platforms don't allow for missteps. So in general, when a person makes a mistake on um, one of these platforms, such as saying something inappropriate or saying something that offends somebody, many times that leads to punishment. Uh, usually the person or people will attack that person verbally on the, on the website, maybe humiliate them publicly. Uh, the other part is it could lead to exclusion or expulsion from the site in, itself. So um, what I was noticing uh, when I thought about this particular platform was I was at the time running day programs. Uh, this was um, many years ago. Um, and in my day programs, we were serving individuals with high behavioral need uh, that needed a lot of behavioral intervention. So they would come to day program and um, along with participating in a lot of the other events that we had them doing on a daily basis, a lot of them wanted to, um, at, for some part of the day, participate on a social media uh, platform. But what I noticed was a lot of them were having these problems with missteps. Uh, so, for example, if I'm an individual, um, you know, my name is Jack, and I'm, you know, um, speaking with somebody else on the site, maybe it's a female named Sally, and I say something inappropriate to Sally, maybe, you know, something, you know, something you wouldn't say in a, in a five-minute conversation, and Sally gets offended, and uh, for whatever reason, I wind up expelled from the site. I saw this happening a lot, and it was sad for me to see because a lot of the guys, the individuals didn't really understand or could really process why they were being excluded, and they so badly wanted to participate on these sites. So I started to, you know, it started my wheels turning at that time, and, um, you know, I thought about, you know, we need a platform that can allow for, um, some sort of experimental kind of learning. Um, you know, none of us have gotten anywhere in our lives by not making mistakes. Um, you know, for most of us, unfortunately, we pay for our mistakes <laughs> and we have to learn that way. Um, sometimes we get expelled or excluded from things too. Um, but we're serving folks with um, challenges and we should have a platform, there should be a platform where they can um, experiment with conversation and have the benefit of someone helping them to navigate these these things. So I was thinking, wow, you know, we have these great DSPs, you know, I'm wondering if we could have a site where 
these DSPs can possibly be leveraged to perform intervention, maybe be mentors. Um, maybe there's a way, or moderators, maybe there's a way that we can, you know, give the individual some anonymity. So, you know, when they do make a misstep um, and they're corrected, they're, it's not like everybody knows who they are and they're not embarrassed. So that was the first thought. And at the time, you know, uh, you know, I, I worked in a nonprofit, so it wasn't like the CEO at the time of the nonprofit would have, you know, been able to, you know, dump money on this and, and, and develop it. I'm, I'm not an IT expert. Um, you know, I've, I'm a, I build programs, you know. So what you needed was IT expertise. And the other part of it is, you know, we all know working in nonprofits, you wear a million hats. Um, so you're not always able to have the, the spare time to, you know, come up with some, you know, transcendent technology, you know. So um, this lay dormant for a while. And I, in the beginning of 2017 or 2018, Greg happened to call me and to talk about his platform. But at the time, it was about um, an employee engagement uh, format that he was talking about. And while talking to him, <clears throat> I figured, oh, this sales guy's calling me about his platform. You know, I've got this idea, and he owns a platform. I wonder maybe I'll reciprocate and, you know, and, and present something to him as well. And, you know, I didn't really expect much, you know, from it, but I just wanted to see what he would say. And an interesting thing happened. Greg responded with a question, uh, you know, and I was like, oh, okay, great. He's got some interest. So we started a dialogue. He asked a question. I answered it. Um, and over time, we developed this relationship and started the seminal construct of mapping out this platform, this new platform with a suggestion for wellness. Um, at the time, Jade and I worked together um, in the same organization, and I uh, certainly wanted to rope her in because of her uh, extreme competence and expertise in so many areas. Um, and Jade, myself, and Greg started mapping out and fleshing out this this platform. Since then, Jade and I moved on to different organizations. Jade is a chief operations officer at an organization, and I'm now the chief executive officer at the ARC Gloucester. I started in 2020, January, um, and, you know, with a leadership change, it's, there's, a, there's enough challenge with that as it is, especially when you're replacing a person who had been here for 30 years. But then two months later, COVID hit. And, um, you know, really thrust us into uh, really crisis. Um, I'm sure everybody understands what that felt like. Um, but even more so than our operational crisis, our individuals went into crisis too. Um, in our state, New Jersey, um, we were mandated to close our, our day programs. Um, so that made, uh, unfortunately, that put the individuals in, to, made, made them have to stay in their group homes for most of the time or home with their families. So it exacerbated feelings of isolation and, and exclusion. Um, luckily, I got to know Robin Blanchard, who is our um, agency nurse at the ARC Gloucester. And um, she really um, informed me, because she's very in touch with the individuals um, at the group homes, of, about how much of a crisis this was on their end, how lonely they felt, how disconnected, and how hurt, you know, it was hurting them. So um, I actually started to talk to Robin at that point about the A suggestion platform, and of course she lit up, got really excited, and I think in, in five minutes Robin had come up with a whole content ge you know generation piece where she had a whole classroom <laughs> and a whole a whole initiative ready to go, which I'm sure she'll she'll be glad to talk about. So um, that's how we started, and then we got with Greg and said, Greg, you know, enough talk. Now we've got to really work on implementation. I know we weren't where we wanted to be um, at the time, but we um, certainly needed at that time to move this to implementation phase. <clears throat> so we started with that one class that Robin uh, started, which was a wake up call with Nurse Robin, and that went very, very well. Um, <clears throat> so since then, you know, we've basically just implemented it more and more and more uh, as we saw that the individuals were really enjoying the platform uh, and in, um, the customization pieces of it. And it's really sort of taken, taken over, you know, in a sense. So, um, you know, we've been able to successfully help individuals establish and maintain connections, um, 
lend support and structure to educational sessions. We had different kinds of classes. Robin can talk about a lot of those things. Um, it served, it can, it can serve as a mechanism to train and educate individuals on proper social media use, which is one of the, one of the missions of the product in the first place. And of course, we can share ideas across family members, share ideas across guardians and families as well. So it's been very, very successful for us. And uh, we're glad to have this opportunity to talk to you about it because there's really nothing else out there like this. Um, and it's definitely something that we need um, as the pandemic has exacerbated all these problems. So now I'd like to turn it back over to Greg to give you sort of a, a, a preview of the site to see what it looks like. So thank you. Uh, let me share my screen, so bear with me just a moment. Yasmina, you're my sounding board. Are you hearing me okay? Yes, perfect. Very good, thank you. <clears throat> All right, uh, so I'm going to take very little time here. I actually want to give the pass the baton to Robin very shortly, but at least, at least let me frame the conversation here. Uh, again, understanding that a suggestion is a platform for constructive, meaningful feedback and communication. Uh, as Jake mentioned, we spend a fair amount of time in the employee engagement and uh, employee engagement space, helping to raise company culture. Uh, but it was actually Jake's vision when he saw this platform and saw the utility of the platform. So not only are we able to manage and moderate conversations across different individuals uh, of services, but what about extending that up to their family members or sharing feedback and ideas across staff and things of that nature? So that's really what a suggestion is designed to do. Along the way, across the development path, uh, we've made a number of enhancements to the platform to uh, to really help to safeguard a, an individual's experience. We want to uh, allow people to offer commentary in anonymous fashion so as to protect them from a, 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 a patient privacy perspective, if you'll allow me. Uh, we have keyword alerting and notifications and triggers in the event that a conversation goes sideways and we need somebody to be able to step in. So there's a lot that's going on under the hood to help facilitate and manage and moderate these conversations, and we can get into that at a later conversation, but uh, I wanted to at least frame the discussion. Um, I've got a number of tabs open already on my screen, so I want to show you this tab uh, briefly. What you're looking at on the screen right now is actually the ARC Gloucester as identified as an organization within our system already. So as you see across the top of the screen, uh, here's the ARC, here's the demographic information, their Facebook and their, you know, their website links and so forth. And what we have here, I've actually collapsed the window, so there's a variety of different uh, you know, suggestion boxes or social rooms you can choose from. But if we're looking at the ARC specifically, uh, by clicking on any one of these boxes, that will make that organization appear in my bank on the left-hand side. See, I just selected that, and here it is. I can choose any one of these. We use the terms social room and suggestion boxes interchangeably. So if I wanted to, I could include any one of these social rooms in my bank. So if I added Nurse Robin's wake-up call room or if we added a room for pet fans or for sport fans, um, God bless Robin, but she keeps posting. I'm a Boston Red Sox fan myself. She keeps posting content regarding the Philadelphia Phillies, and so that makes for some lively conversations, which is a lot of fun. Uh, so understanding the concept here, you can create as many different social rooms and or suggestion boxes as you choose. And when I made the comment earlier today talking about Robin being our CGE, content generating engine, she is doing a fantastic job in identifying what are different topics of conversations that individuals in different houses may have interest in, and let's spur up conversations and then go ahead and manage and moderate those conversations. And it's really been a very impressive. It's been a lot of fun to watch unfold. So from a very high level, that's what the platform is designed to do. And Robin, I'm actually going to turn it to you. I don't know if you want to talk at all about some of your experiences with individuals themselves and watching them and, and kind of managing and moderating our conversations as you've been working with them. Do you mind uh, taking us through a couple of rooms, Robin? Sure. Well, uh, let's see. Um, here we go. We have the um, food groups room and Nurse Robin's wake-up call. Well, I'd like to introduce all the five food groups and talk about each one and express, show bright, bold colored pictures. You can open that up and see all the pictures. And people can take pictures of their favorite fruit or vegetable, or even say, ew, I hate fruits, or I hate vegetables, and I hate this food group. But 
it's the, it gives them the ability to express themselves freely without being threatened or feeling uncomfortable. They are respected in this forum and they can learn from it. Um, we have educational interests, um, person-centered educational interests um, that have been um, kind of squeltered lately because a lot of our um, typical classes, lifelong learning classes that individuals would go to or camp retreats that they would go to to learn things have been virtual. So they may um, be learning things in a virtual way or doing things at home differently. But this gives them the opportunity to show pictures of what they're working on at home and have that um, freedom to express themselves like, hey, I wanted to be a farmer. I've always wanted to be a farmer. I wanted to learn how to grow fruits and veggies. And this is what I've learned. And they can show the steps of, you know, putting the, the soil and the seed and how it's grown throughout the week. And we explore that together and cheer each other on. Hey, great job. I think you're an awesome you're going to be an awesome farmer. You know, we, we cheer each other on, and it's it's a lot of fun. We have somebody who wanted to be a sports commentator, and like Greg was saying, we go back and forth with the different teams, but that's really fun. It, it's a friendly way to poke fun at each other, like what team you like, what you don't like, what sport you do or don't like, and you get passionate about your interest in whatever room you choose. Um, you pick and choose what room you want to enter into or create yourself even. Um, here's a lovely lady that joined our Rutgers collaborative class. Um, we have Rutgers SnapEd. We're learning about healthy eating with all the five food groups. And if we open that those pictures up, you'll see that we created a recipe together. I was right on site with them with my mask on and keeping my social distance. And I took the pictures of these folks that are working together at the um, in one of our centers, and we're creating a cowboy caviar. And I can't tell you how exciting this is for people because you're getting to see old friends that you haven't seen before. I mean, haven't seen in a long time because you haven't been too into your achievement center or your program or your job, your workplace or your church or whatever, wherever you see your friends and beers. You get to see these people, you get to learn something, have a little fun, and express whether you liked it or not. Now, I would say uh, we had three groups making this recipe. We had a lot of fun. We layered things up with mason jars. We tried it different ways. We put it on salads. And we had some people said it was disgusting and gross, and we laughed. Um, but other folks really liked it and, and felt really healthy. And some people made jokes because there was a lot of beans in it. So, I mean, there's a lot of camaraderie, and it's awesome. It's just so much fun to see people liven up again because they're now seeing their friends, their family members, their peers that they haven't seen in a long time, and also making new friends if they've moved or haven't been able to get out in a very long time. Um, so it's really awesome. So um, also there's person-centered um, exercises we do. Someone says, hey, I can't. I can't move my arms, but I can move my legs. Can you give me an idea of what I can do? Well, we throw some exercises out for that individual and people like that individual. And so physical therapists, occupational therapists, nurses, and um, just exercise enthusiasts that ha um, can get everyone involved in exercising more, the right to exercise, the right to eat healthy, or right to not or to the right to choose not to eat healthy. Um, but it gives them a safe platform and a billboard to express their concepts and ideas and advertise their, need, their needs, desires, and wants. Um, so I see um, I've noticed that um, some of our folks with behavioral health concerns um, and, and struggles and challenges have really come to life with this. Um, if COVID has, if it, it's not enough to have um, a diagnosis of depression or um, clinical diagnosis of anxiety disorder, and then on top of it, now you're shut in with COVID and you can't see the people, the therapists, the peers, and the, the folks that normal, normally support you in the way that you used to see them. 
So this is a great outlet for individuals and counselors even to take advantage um, of, of this opportunity to give ex fun exercises that a person can do to help alleviate the anxieties, decrease anxieties, um, decrease level of depression. Um, we've even uh, had billboard type posts out that we were expressing like um, group greeting card messages when we had serious losses throughout the COVID process uh, um, pandemic, we've had deep sympathy cards sent out and people would express how they felt about that individual that we all lost and knew. And everyone got their chance to express themselves and, and be heard um, in a safe platform. Also, it could be a really funny message we're sending out, like jokes. Um, laughter is the best medicine. I have a room called that. Uh, we throw out a joke of the day, or you can throw out your own joke and respond to it. And it's so much fun because they could be really quirky, weird, and maybe not so funny jokes, but we get a kick out of each other and we'll cheer each other on. And, and um, sometimes uh, it might be a little inappropriate, but a suggestions can kind of smooth that out to make it more appropriate. So that no one will get offended because joking, you know, we're not professional comedians. We don't know what all the rules are, but we don't want anybody getting their feelings hurt. We just like to have fun. Um, let's see, what else? I, I just feel like it has been the answer for a lot of our prayer when we, we want to help the people that we serve um, to feel acknowledged, to feel appreciated, to express their personal right, and, and to express their creativity. And um, it's, it's just been amazing. And the feedback, the friendships, the um, interactions have been really amazing. And I've been face-to-face -face with these folks and seeing the difference in them. And it's uplifting. It, it has been a pr privilege and a pleasure to be a part of this. Um, I absolutely love it. I can't say enough. Robin, that's great. That's great. Thank you. And uh, Jade, if I may, uh, if I can put you on the spot, you were you were part of the conversations back in the early days when Jake and I started having these conversations, and you you and he both worked the same program. Um, Jade, you had some different thoughts about where we can take this, and you know, here's what we're doing today, but where might we be going tomorrow? Do you mind? No, not at all. Um, thank you, Greg. Hello and good afternoon, everyone. I'm really excited um, from the very beginning of the start of this project and the possibilities. Um, Greg was very right about one thing. I've almost always got a coffee in hand, so I'm always running and I'm always going. Um, and I work pretty much the same way. So um, once being introduced to this and listening to um, Jake and Greg go back and forth, I immediately started running in 12 different directions um, as to where I thought this could go. Um, from working in the human services field, I had the opportunity to work across so many different kinds of programs and serve so many different kinds of people. Um, and in this, one of the first places that I thought of um, was the foster care system. So we have children and young adults that are in the foster care system, some diagnosed, some undiagnosed with disabilities um, that often have to suffer through the loss of communication with friends, family, there's a loss of community um, as they transition from their family home into the foster care system. And with this platform, um, not only would they be able to um, have a way to communicate with loved ones, friends, and their prior community after placement, um, but this presents a safe place to connect with monitoring um, and the ability to detect issues that um, some of these folks may be feeling and haven't shared with their foster parents or with their caseworker or with therapists. So then we can start talking about prevention, which is almost where we always want to be in this field. Um, think about the foster parent community. They can also benefit from this, um, having a way to connect and share their experiences, best practices, and general support for one another. Um, it's so important because there's always a need for foster families, and one of the issues that often gets shared across the board is a feeling of isolation, um, not having anyone to talk through, uh, you know, to talk about what they're going through. And oftentimes the caseworkers or managers may not have the time to always get back to every single family. So this could be huge in that space. Um, as we start to look for 
individuals who have mental health issues, both children and adults, whether they're at home or in placement. This is another tool that can help connect them to their peers to share their experiences and um, supports and also link them to the community, which is what we're always looking to do is to get folks involved and invested in the community at large. Um, accessibility is so key, um, especially in institutionalized settings, uh, which have a history of limited resources for interactions with loved ones. So for children of incarcerated parents, this can be an amazing tool to give families an opportunity uh, to communicate, to be involved, to share in their children's lives. It can have a real impact on the children as well as the incarcerated parent. And then there's also um, the goal of helping these folks transition back into society if they've had a connection with their family and their loved ones and their children, that transition might be made easier. Um, nursing homes, as we've seen with COVID, um, you know, folks are not having an opportunity to share and to always be able to be a part of visiting their loved ones and those sorts of things. So as we're looking into care plans, um, you know, maybe a loved one is caring for a parent and they live out of state, you know, or it's a far distance that they have to travel. This can be used in so many different ways, not only just to communicate with your loved one, but also to communicate with the staff and maybe to make some of those important decisions. Um, you know, we can't have this conversation without talking about the impact that it's had on school systems um, and their ability to adapt and continue to introduce this kind of technology. Um, schools that maybe could not do it before and wanted to or weren't sure about it now, thanks to COVID, have been thrust into this space. And so there is always a need to ensure that now that children have to use this and they're needing this, um, you know, that there needs to be a way for them to navigate it safely and appropriate, uh, appropriately. And for school systems, over the past few years, we've seen an increase of online bullying, um, school websites being hacked with inappropriate material. I think introducing this can help prevent some of those things in the future as well. So, I mean, there's just so many ways and so many platforms that this can really um, just take off. I don't see anywhere that this could not be used in a positive way. And again, in this space and in the human services field, one of the things we always want to talk about and what we usually get the least support on is prevention. And that's what this is. That's outstanding. That's great. Um, so very quickly, uh, by the way, Jade, I, did I just interrupt? Are you all set? Well, you know what? There was one other area I was going to touch with the schools if we have time. Go ahead, take another couple minutes if you like. Okay, excellent. So um, one of the other things, um, and I'm not sure who may be on this call that's experiencing this, that you may have children who are in school and whether they are going to school full time um, or whether they are remotely at home, one of the things schools are having to do is find ways to connect with parents, families, and children. So one of the issues that I am experiencing personally, and I know that others are as well, is each school is using different platforms. Each teacher can be using a different way to connect, whether it's Google Meet, whether it's Zoom, and it's confusing, it's time consuming. Um, for some children, they've had them start their own websites um, and had them create their own emails, which also kind of adds another layer of difficulty in communication. Um, I feel that this platform could serve as, uh, you know, pretty much a one-stop shop for information for parents, a way for parents to communicate with teachers. Um, if we're talking about a child that has an IEP, if we're talking about a child that has speech therapy, OT, PT, this is a great way for everybody to come together and have those conversations, but also to, again, create a space for children to be able to socially invest with one another. Um, during most of the calls and the way that the structure is set up for online learning and remote learning, children don't have time to socialize. They don't have time to talk. Um, things move very quickly. And while the education piece is important, especially for young children and children on the spectrum, we know that they need that socialization piece. Um, it's so vital. And again, giving it to them in a creative way is also really important. So much of school is structured as it's supposed to be, but we're starting to lose those pieces that allow kids to be creative and for those different learners to find ways that they can learn and things that work for them. So I also believe that this can work in that way um, as children may be able to create their own rooms. There may be rooms that are set up just for counseling. 
Um, at this time, you know, the way I always look at this platform is there's multi use because you may have the child or the individual you're serving. But then there's also you have to look at the providers or the caretakers on their end. They need these supports as well. So, you know, this system allows you to have both of those things happening simultaneously if you want to. Um, if we go back to the use for folks in the IDD space, you know, you can either keep it just within your agency or you could expand it to other agencies. You know, you can keep it within your school district, or you can allow children to have interactions with children from other schools in other areas. I mean, there's just so many ways that a platform like this can be used, especially at a time when we don't have um, access to one another in the traditional way that we're used to. And Robin, before I go back to the slides, I didn't know if there's anything else you wanted to, uh, to offer as well. And that might be Robin on mute because I put her on the spot. <laughs> so my apologies, Robin. Uh, Can so you let's hear me? do this. I hear Can you now. You hear yeah. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. So I almost was hesitant to mention these things, but I think I'm, I feel safe sharing this with the group. Uh, as when I grew up, I always learned that we don't, talk about politics, money, and religion when we're in a group of friends or peers, unless we want trouble. But, you know, this A suggestions, um, the posts could, uh, and the suggestions could simply be about your right to vote, exercising your right to vote, sharing how to vote, what these political parties represent, um, learning. It's a learning process and exercising your rights. Um, in a non-threatening forum. Uh, money, money, it doesn't have to be what we have in our account. We don't certainly wouldn't want to share that, but if somebody did, A suggestions would wipe that off and we wouldn't see what someone had in their account. We would, if they're talking about money, they might say, oh, I have $14 left in my account. Well, A suggestions will wipe that off and we'll just talk about whatever else they were speaking of. Like maybe, hey, I gotta eat healthy, but it's hard to eat healthy on a tight budget. All I can buy is pasta. Well, we can talk about healthy things that we can eat and and purchase, um, save money and, and being healthy. Um, religion, everyone has a right to exercise a right to, to their religious choice or lack of religion. Um, I feel like this is a safe opportunity for people to do this without any problems from social media platforms like Facebook, you know, it, you wouldn't have that attack. You know, everyone has, our folks do have the right to vote, to spend money, to have their, choose their own religion. Um, and I feel like this is, these are really important topics that have to be touched on safely and comfortably with friends and with people that they can trust. And a suggestions platform would be their own community and us because we are we are them and they are we. I, I feel like um I wouldn't I wouldn't be the same without them. I, I, I will always have people with intellectual and developmental disabilities in my life and I, I wouldn't feel complete without them. I feel like they, they need to have everything that we we have and they have the right to everything we have. And I want to help them express that. And I feel like this would be a safe forum for that. That's incredible. That's great. Uh, Robin, thank you. Jade, thank you as well. Um, so now we've covered what are we going to talk about? We've shown you not just what are we going to talk about, but then how do we do it? And let's talk in terms of some next steps, meaning uh, I'm going to combine, if you will, well, where do we go from here and what's future state and, well, what are we looking for? Uh, so a couple quick slides just kind of to put a bow on this, if you will. Um, so right now, uh, you know, we're running across a number of different houses across the arc, and we're talking about rolling out into their their camp fund and sun when that, that opportunity becomes available. So there's a variety of different use cases here. We've had uh, some conversations about well, actually, we've had conversations with a variety of different organizations, um, some of them in the, on the East Coast, some of them, you know, out on the West Coast, actually. So uh, if we were to talk in terms of creating national or uh, larger social rooms 
that might be an opportunity. Part of the reason, and as I'm coming to learn in this space, part of the reason why a number of these individuals have expressed interest in social media is to make new friends and to make new connections. So what if we were to help to help them to establish new friends and new connections in a safe, anonymous, healthy environment, moderated and managed environment, uh, but then to be able to do so literally across the country where maybe they didn't have that opportunity, or if they did try to do that on existing social media platforms, well, there's there's a whole host of challenges there, as Jake had alluded to earlier. So that's some of where we're going. Um, I had talked at the outset about not only using the platform for individual communication so that individuals can share ideas amongst themselves, but what if we were to extend this beyond individual use cases to their family members, their caregivers? What if we created social rooms for family members to share ideas with one another? Uh, I'm the parent, let's say, for example, that I'm a parent of a uh, a 16-year-old young man who's been living with IDD or another mental behavioral challenge for some time, and I, as a parent, I'm just, I'm struggling. Well, wouldn't it be nice to be able to socialize with other parents and other family members in the same kind of capacity? Um, ultimately, uh, what we're trying to do with the platform, once we have users on the system, as Robin and Jade had, had both spoken to, our ability to use this as a support structure. How can we use this as a mechanism to teach and expand their horizons in a way, once again, you're, you're hearing us with the repeated themes here, but in a safe, constructive, healthy environment uh, where those conversations can be managed and moderated appropriately by staff who know exactly what they're doing. Uh, one of the things that we're looking to do we're already in a position to capture discrete data on a whole host of different conversation threads and topics. Uh, so when, wouldn't it be nice to be able to capture discrete data and to be able to leverage some of this information for billing purposes with, with either Medicaid or other payers? And that's an area we're going to be exploring. And then furthermore, Jake spoke on this a little earlier, I believe, but uh, our ability to actually create social rooms and create conversation threads that tie into specific individuals and their uh, their IEPs. If we can do that, uh, well, here again, that becomes an opportunity to better serve the individual, but also to help substantiate some of program operations. And before I start talking a little bit outside of my own area of expertise, I'm not the CEO of a program, Jake is. So I might defer to him on this, but you know, those are some of the things that we're doing today and some of the things, areas that we're looking to go into in the future and, well, frankly, we're excited to have an audience who might like to do that with us. Uh, Jake, I might turn to you again. Uh, any thoughts on, you know, where we're going, uh, things that you might like to do going forward, uh, et cetera? Do you mind? No, I don't mind. Thank you. Thanks, Greg. Excellent. Um, thanks to all, the to all the panelists. Great job um, describing the platform and the use cases. Um, so we can agree that connecting with others via virtual and social media platforms has become more prevalent, uh, really necessary, as, especially as a result of COVID. Um, however, our folks in the IDD space are being left behind because there's nothing currently available to help them develop the skills needed to foster and maintain safe social connections in a virtual context you know, independent of prescribed programming like Zoom meetings or the like. So, you know, these individuals are missing out on the independence they can enjoy through making sustainable connections via engaging successfully on, you know, available mainstream social media platforms, you know, for, like Facebook. Um, so what we have, I guess, what we have um, been successful at doing here today, I hope, is um, showing that the application of the concept uh, with you know, this partnership between, you know, the ARC Gloucester and a suggestion uh, that it's shown that this platform is a one of a kind solution to social engagement and education in a virtual context to support individuals with IDD. Um, you know, the product allows for personal choice. It allows for independence, safe, moderated social engagement. It also allows for anonymity, uh, staff facilitation, and really important, non-prescribed 24-7 access 365 days a year, um, which is different from what you're, you know, what we've seen lately and what everybody seem to, seems to have come to depend on, which is the Zoom platforms, which are, everybody knows you have to be on at a certain time, it's for a certain interval, and then it's over. You know, where this is a platform that, uh, you know, an individual can get engage on 
um, with their choice of a plethora of different conversation rooms uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It gives your staff basically programming 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, and Greg mentioned the other um, ancillary, be ancillary benefits like, um, you know, the discrete data ex extrapolation to um, meet an individual's, you know, ISP goals or, um, you know, for Medicaid billing. That's something very unique and we're working to develop as well. So basically the platform is still under development um, and we need more collaborative partners to participate in order to realize the full potential of this unique and I would call it transformative technology. Um, the product is designed to connect people across the globe. In other words, there is really no limit to the reach of this product. Um, and in order for us to establish what that looks like, we need more organizations to be willing to join us in this uh, mission to develop this product. Um, you know, we're all working hard to address very enormous social justice causes facing individuals with IDD and their families. Um, and this is a really unique opportunity for nonprofits to join together um, and really do something for our own space. Um, not relying on, you know, um, you know, the large for-profit entities to develop. Um, you know, they're developing other things, I'm sure. But <clears throat> if we don't do this, uh, if we don't take care of our own, who's going to do it for us, to be honest? You know, we're all people on this panel, you know, that care and uh, we work in this space. This is our lives. We live this, you know. So um, for us, this is very, very important, and uh, we feel as though, it would transform the individual's lives. Can you imagine a platform like this fully developed and running and something that you can plug into 24 hours a day, seven days a week, um, talk in, and, you know, just imagine it could reach all the areas that Jade had, you know, described and, you know, just besides IDD, you know, all the other areas that can, it can reach. So what we need is we need people that are interested in learning more uh, we'd like to talk to you, um, you know, uh, aside from this this, this uh, presentation. And um, I believe right now there is a um, there is a slide up with contact information. And uh, you know, I would say go ahead and reach out to Greg if you're interested in learning more. Um, you're also welcome to reach out to me at the Arc Gloucester. I'm easy to find. Um, and I want to thank you all for being uh, participating on this today. Um, we really appreciate the opportunity to present this to you. So I want to go ahead and open the floor up for, or turn it back over to Greg and open the floor up for any questions um, that you may have. Uh, this is Yasmina. Thank you so much, Jake, Greg, uh, Jade, and Robin. It's it's super interesting, and and I've been I've been a big fan of the platform. Um, we do have a few questions coming through, and uh, for those of you that have questions, either put them in question and answer box or the chat box, and I will get to them and um, um, ask them uh, verbally. So one of the, the first question that came through was, can different agencies use the same chat rooms? And so individuals from different agencies can talk to each other, or does it stay within one agency? So that's an excellent question. Um, so what's cool about this is um, each organization can create an environment that's centric to their um, organization. And at the same time, uh, the, the rest of the platform can be open to them as well. So your individuals can um, speak or talk or engage with each other within your own walls. And they can go outside your walls. You know, uh, an, an individual in New Jersey can um, interact with somebody in California. Uh, they can be in the same room. You know, um, Greg can explain how we have um, made the access or created the access for, for all of that. Um, but the answer is yes, they can reach across and uh, communicate, inter interagency communication. So I, I would only dovetail on that very slightly um, to protect 
uh, anonymity and privacy of individuals who are participating in the platform. Uh, the ARC room that you saw today, we have permission to be able to show some of the content from that room because here again, we're dealing with individuals and their actual, in, in one example, had an actual individual and her, uh, her photo. And so she gave consent for that to happen. Um, if any of the, anyone on this call today, if you were to log in and try to gain access to the ARC roster, uh, unless you have been granted permission to participate in that room, you would not have permission. So it is, it is a locked down room. Now, having said that, if we were to create a different room where perhaps we have an organization in San Francisco and an organization in New Jersey and an organization in Chicago, and we were to create a room where individuals can each join that room, uh, we, the short answer to the question is, yes, we can enable that. Uh, in fact, we're excited to be able to do that. Uh, but we do want to be able to put provisions in place to make sure that people are effectively protected. And the, the net effect of that is to help safeguard against some of the predatory behavior uh, and the, the false information that happens on a lot of existing social media channels. So I'll pause. There's more that, that can be explained there if you like, but I think for the time being, that's probably going to answer the question, at least for the moment. I hope that helps. Yes, Mina? Is, is it HIPAA compliant is another follow-up question. Right. So uh, at, at present, yes, uh, though I will share with you that uh, we want to put a couple more security provisions in place. Uh, but thus far, yes, the only name and identifying information that is available to any user on the system is whatever username and alias an individual chooses for themselves. The only way in which you can actually identify who users are are through back-end administrative consoles that we manage behind the scenes. But from the, the user's perspective, if I want to call myself Pink Fluffy Unicorn, then you will only ever know me as Pink Fluffy Unicorn. So to that extent, yes, it is. Thank you. Um, when Jade was talking in the examples that she was providing, um, in those example, examples, who is providing individuals' devices or Internet access to participate in these online groups or even do something like Skype with family? Um, this question comes from someone who is a support coordinator, and they have found almost none of the group homes they work with have put much effort into assisting with technology issues. Right. They don't, people don't have computer at home with camera, reliable internet, et cetera. So can you speak to some of those issues? Yes, I can. Um, Jade, I'll take this. Um, you know, in, in building this out and implementing this, that is some that is an area that we stumbled upon too. Um, and I think a lot of agencies uh, share in probably, um, you know, this sort of deficit in regard to um, the web of, of, of internet access that, you know, individuals have. Um, so, you know, we've had to cross that road too. Uh, we did have to, uh, you know, make sure that we expanded that uh, by putting in more equipment um, in our homes so that the individuals can interact. Um, and so that, that, is, that, is, that is a piece that we've had to build out along, you know, along the implementation phase. But, we've, but to answer your question, we've, we've provided that for our individuals. Do you have any experience uh, regarding uh, grants at all in this process as well? Greg, are you asking me that question? I, I did ask you that question, yes. Well, you know I do, Greg. <laughs> well, I, I didn't know if that helped in your process along the way here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Yes, and of course there are grants um, that we are working on. Uh, so, for example, um, you know, this was also, um, like I said in the, earlier, this this initiative was exacerbated, um, and and you know, by the COVID pandemic, you know, it it forced agencies to, you know, pivot really quickly to any kind of remote or internet um, kind of programming that was available, so that we can kind of, you know, get interaction, and you know, people weren't suffering from social uh, exclusion, um, and there have been a lot of grants uh, that that have uh, been in place to help mitigate those expenses. Um, so we, we have been able to take advantage of quite a few grants to help mitigate the expenses of buying the extra equipment um, and things like that. 
so we can also we can also help with uh, being a resource for that um, if anybody's interested. Um, thank you. Another um, attendee talk is wondering about how CMS views an organization using this in lieu of op open access um, as we're working with adults. Uh, can you define the open access part? I didn't quite understand that. Um, Kim, can you define that? Um, um, yeah. Oh, well, it sounds like any social platform, open access. Like, I'm assuming, like, Facebook or... Oh, how? Okay, so the person yeah. wants to know how CMS views it? Yes. You know, um, it's something CMS has not seen before. Uh, this is this is not something that really anybody has seen before. Um, and you know, uh, I think you know, CMS is just like any other you know entity is kind of trying to process all this and uh, pivot as well in regard to what they will consider. You know, as far as reimbursement and things like that. Uh, there are quite a few technologies that are available now that you know CMS you know it hasn't really approved for for funding um, yet or pay or you know for payment yet. But um, it's just it'll it'll you know it's in time I I believe there will be um, more of an open mind to these kind of uh, platforms because they're ne they're ne uh, necessary at this point. We're not sure how long we'll be in this COVID posture, um, and I think the longer it's, we stay in the posture, you know it will kind of force CMS to, you know, kind of pivot. But currently, currently, you know, you know, they really, I don't really have any data on that. Thank you. And Kim, let me know if you have any follow-up questions on it. Um, another question, does an individual need to have an organization that they're associated with that has partnered with a suggestion in order to use this pl platform? Or can individuals without an organization affiliation join conversations? Greg, I'm going to I'm going to turn it over to you. Um, yeah. So uh, let's see here. The way we've deployed this thus far, um, and so I'm going to talk to you about present state. We'll talk about future state. Uh, the way we've deployed this thus far, if you are an individual and you are participating in one of the ARCS programs and you have been whitelisted to participate in these rooms, then you can have free reign. So go to town, have a good time. That's great. Um, as regards uh, perhaps a national room or a social room, uh, I, it, as I'm learning the space, because, again, in full disclosure, I'm, I'm a nerd. Right, I'm a techie guy. I'm, I'm I don't run a program, uh, so as I am learning the space, uh, I understand that there are some individuals who are out there who aren't necessarily uh, attending programs, either uh, receiving full uh, date services or residential services, and yet uh, they are uh, supported in some capacity by you know state funding and so forth. And would it be nice for them to be able to enter into rooms where they can participate as well? So the short answer to your question is. Yes, we could create those rooms. We then get into a question of, well, who is going to manage and moderate those rooms, which is a, a very healthy and fun, it'd be a great conversation to explore. From a technical perspective, there's nothing prevent, preventing that. From a logistics and management perspective, that's a little bit different. One of the things that Jake and I have discussed, and I'll, I'll just kind of dangle this carrot out there for a moment. One of the things that Jake and I have discussed is the idea of creating a uh, another, uh, I guess, uh, a business partnership or another entity where we can actually assist other programs in launching this application and training those programs as to best practices. And perhaps along the way, we are also creating uh, almost a, a consulting group or another entity who can help to manage and moderate conversations on behalf of, of social rooms that live outside of the ARC but still need uh, moderation and, you know, people like Robin who actually appreciate how conversations need to unfold and how do we go about managing and maintaining those, those conversations. So that's an overly wordy way of saying from a technical perspective, there's no reason, there's nothing prohibiting us from doing that, uh, but we do need to figure out some of the logistics behind it. So I hope that that's not exactly the answer you're looking for, but I hope I got close. Thank you, Greg. Um, I just wanted to be mindful of time. We have about a minute left, and if you have any questions, please feel free to put them in a chat box or question and answer. And I wanted to just take a few seconds and just 
see if um, any of the panelists have sort of la like last sort of closing words and just to make sure if you if any of the attendees have any um, um, any additional questions, contact Greg um, directly and then he will be able to field um, different questions to different people. Um, any parting last words? Sure. Uh, Greg, is that all right? Sorry. Please do so. Sure. Okay. All right. So, um, again, we want to thank everybody for participating, participating today and give us, giving us an opportunity to, to show this platform. Um, again, the platform is still under, under development and we need more collaborative partners. So that's part of what we're asking for um, is we're asking for organizations who are interested to please contact us or, or entities. If you're not attached to an organization, contact us as we'd like to um, add more uh, collaborative effort to fleshing out the potentiality of this platform. Again, it's a global platform. It's a transformative technology but we need collaboration from our other IDD partners um, to make this really a reality. Um, and again, it's a unique opportunity for nonprofits to actually affect, um, you know, the, the, the enormous social justice causes that we are trying to um, fight every day for our individuals. So again, I want to thank everybody for joining this panel, uh, for joining this discussion, and we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you so yeah, much. Um, one last question came through. Um, just for clarity, does a suggestion moderate the chat rooms or does the agency moderate the chat rooms? Uh, the agent, so we let, we, the, the platform allows us to leverage our DSP staff to actually be moderators, um, interventionists, mentors, um, and um, actually, you know, do the intervention pieces to to help the individuals engage. Everybody, you know, individuals are at, at different cognitive levels um, and they engage as much as they can, but obviously, um, you know, the DSPs are essential in this piece to help them to really fully uh, engage on the platform. Thank you. Um, again, thank you so much, Greg, Jade, Jake, and Robin. Um, we, like I said, I've, um, we've, we've recorded the, this presentation. We will share it shortly, and please feel free to contact uh, the panelists. Um, again, thank you again. We're at the hour, so I wanted to just uh, um, say thank you and have a great rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you as well. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Take care, everyone. Have a great Bye, afternoon. Bye, everyone. Have you a great too. afternoon. Bye. Bye.